where do you think audiobooks fit in the conversation early childhood books do you prefer kids to read them themselves are you pref- like what are your i see you moving oh, there. So, i'm curious what what are your thoughts there Okay, so the point of reading to young children, I'm thinking out loud, is to model fluent reading, right? We want them to be able, before they can formally read in the formal sense, we want them to be able to hear what it sounds like to be a reader, like the cadence. Mm-hmm. I think audiobooks can be a tool, but they have to be used very carefully. I, I okay. think they can be a tool, but they shouldn't be the only tool that teachers utilize for children to have exposure. Because some some kids may really gravitate to audiobooks, right? But mm-hmm. what's the point of reading comprehension? Are you planning your read aloud to pause at certain points and ask them questions to make sure they're really listening to it? Because some of these audiobooks, they sound like movies. <laughs> like they, they sound like whole feature length films. Yeah, yeah. So are you as a teacher, you using this as a little bit of break for yourself or you're using this as a different type of experience? for your 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 diverse learners Hmm. okay i i didn't okay you're again i don't teach (laughs) so because i'm like i never thought about it that so uh, could teachers be possibly utilizing audiobooks as a kind of like a break which you know not that they don't deserve breaks but again i taught second grade one year i don't know how (laughs) folks do it i i I wish i had known about that i probably would have used some audiobooks for some breaks because Tell you what, that tattle talent is no joke. So I, I get it from that sense, but it's not something I never th- I, that I've thought about. I, I just think you know, because I, I have special ed background, mm-hmm. and so I think about it from a maybe IEP level or maybe five or four type of situation where we want our kids to be able to engage. Because I know teachers will tell me, "Oh, my kids can't read that. Uh, that that's above their level," and and so I'm like, I'm just thinking about options. So. I saw your face. Now I kind of want to ask you about. <laughs> well, true. I kind of want to ask you about that now. That. And it's it's it, and I've I've had that in other roles as a coach, mm-hmm. working with you know people in you know in classrooms who may or may not have never worked with students. Say, oh, I don't know about you. You know, reading this book, I think the vocabulary is above yeah. them. What's the harm in exposing it to them? Right. Think mm-hmm. about. Think about those three and four years I talked about in regards to space, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't think they knew anything about space, but at some point they've heard it, they've had exposure to it. So why can't we give all children that equitable access to exposure? Because we never know what they may gravitate to or or, or really take on unless we expose them to it. There's no harm in exposure. Absolutely. Shout out to Davina. Davina, I'm glad you joined us. She says, uh, yes, unfortunately, I have seen it. There are no instructional informed intent at times when teachers are. Uh, teachers use audibles. However, audibles allow all learners to access knowledge and content. There has to be an informed intent in any resource use. What do you I think? Intentional. It has to be intentional. Are you planning, just like you would plan your regular read aloud, are you planning when you're going to stop? ask comprehension questions, give students the opportunity to turn and talk to one another. Like it has, there has to be a plan behind it, not, yeah. you know, shoot, this, this audio book is 15 minutes. So I'm going to give a <laughs> minute break, breather, right? You just, <laughs> it, it, no one's doing that. No, no one's doing that, Cam. No one's doing that. You know, but if that's the case, just turn the radio on. If that's what you're going to do, like, just let them, right? There has to be, oh, there has to be listen, a okay. behind In that. The in the age of COVID teaching, and thank you, Davina, I appreciate you for, for hanging out with us today. Um, in the in the age of, of COVID teaching, I mean, it's, it's we got a lot of folks that are trying to figure out, like, when do I get these breaks? When can I kind of get some time to myself? Um, and so we, we do what we got to do to survive because, yeah. you know, mental health to me is, is very important. And so I don't want to take that away from anybody, especially when you're, you're having a hard time. But I, I, did, I was curious because... Again, I hear those comments. Oh, I don't want to teach this book or utilize this book because my kids can't read it. And I like what you said, Cammy. You talked about like before y'all even started reading the book on that space book, 
uh, you asked him, what do you know about space? And then allowed the kids. And I, and, and would you recommend also that maybe you should put maybe some definitions, uh, some some key terms maybe with before you start reading those books as well? I mean, what are your thoughts there? So one of the things that I do in my work and see is part of the model is with repeated read alouds is mm -hmm. explicitly teaching vocabulary. So pick okay. out essential vocabulary from the text and teach it, create child-friendly definitions mm -hmm. and teach that word, teach those words very specifically and intentionally. Okay. It's about intent. Intent. Okay. So now not you and not use as a break. But also be be intentional with our approach to to learning. Okay, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now you know I have thoroughly enjoy, enjoyed this conversation, Cami. Um, is there anything that we have not touched on in regards to diverse books that you want to um, to bring out? Um, one thing I wanted to bring out again was the point you made about are are diverse books enough? No, yeah. and I think. As adults, before we open up a book, we have to explore and maybe undo and unlearn some things that we have about diverse books. Like, so before you, you know, you you get all gung ho after listening to this, and you're just like, oh, I really want to um, bring in more diverse books. Mm -hmm. Do a little bit of unpacking of your own biases. Like, start thinking about why do I want to do this. Uh, what types of books do I want to introduce to students or let other people know about? and um, just really do your own homework on who the authors are and what the intent and purpose behind those books really are. And, and really start working on thinking about your own biases, especially if you are a preschool teacher. I think sometimes mm -hmm. in the early childhood space, we think of it as this, you know, this paradise of just warmth and happiness, but there's bias there too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so start, because, you know, the studies show that, you know, Black preschool children are more likely to be suspended or expelled, right? So mm -hmm. there's, there's bias even in that space. So really start working on unpacking some of your biases. What would you say is your favorite book to recommend for any early childhood uh, teacher out there? Oh, one of my favorite books. I really, okay, so... This is probably y'all might be like, oh, can we go on like almost like the audiobook route? <laughs> so there's this <laughs> there's this series on Netflix called Bookmarks. It's called Bookmarks Celebrating Black Voices. Have you heard of it? No. It's called Bookmarks Celebrating Black Voices. And that it is um like it's a one season series of black celebrities reading um children's books by by black authors. Um, like Tiffany Haddish is reading a book about hair. We have Caleb McLaughlin reading the book um, called Crown. Um, uh, Grace Byers reads her book called, um, gosh, I know the name of the books, but it's a great series. I love all those books there. So I think that would be a great start. Just So it's almost with the audio book route, but they are actual books, but it's like celebrities reading the books. Okay. Like, but it, and, it's, and it's children friendly. And it's child friendly, yes. It's, it's okay. Beautiful. The animations are gorgeous. They actually show the book. Um, I really love Lupita Nyong'o's book called Sulwe. Mm -hmm. um, beautifully written, but yeah. oh, I can't pick just one. So I think that series is a great start. So I was just I was online, um, maybe it was Facebook, and I even saw a video as well. Uh, Ken, Dr. Kendi has a new one, a newer one called "The Good Night." The good night racism um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a take on good night moon, uh, which is supposed to be a, a children's book. And I think he actually had his daughter read the audio version of the book. Um, have you seen that book being utilized in classrooms uh, or, or would you recommend that book being utilized in classrooms? I might be a little biased. I'm a fan of Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. So uh -huh. I, I like all of his work. <laughs> So I, I, I would, I, I would, but I understand in some places that may not be allowed. Yeah. Um, I definitely would recommend any of Dr. Kendi's work. Yeah. And and, and not in and, and those kind of situations, not just for the teacher and, and the student, but also, you know, as parents, I think those kind of books are, are helpful. A, a book that I, I like to recommend is, uh, uh, man, I'm going to say it incorrectly because I don't have it in front of me, but it's like, it happened in our town. 
Um, mm, yes, I've heard that one. And that one's about like you have two families. You have a white family, you have a black family. There's a police brutality situation that happens within the town. And the book talks about how the two different families basically discuss what happened in, oh, something happened in our town. I, I'm going to have to look it up. I'll find it. I've heard um, of it. I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. I can see the illustrations right now. Yes. Yes. And I think that one's a good one, especially when you're thinking about prejudice, uh, not pre prejudice, privilege, uh, and, and just kind of in police brutality and those kind of conversations. Again, I always tell people, because people tell me, oh, they're too young to to talk about these type of things at, the, you know, four and five years years old. It's just way too early. But I say, no, there's there's ways that we can have those conversations. It's going to obviously look different for a four-year-old versus a 14-year-old. But I think we're doing our kids a disservice if we don't introduce a lot of these concepts early on. And not only that, sometimes they they bring us the concept when we're not ready to answer. Mm -hmm. right? They bring certain things to us, and it's just like, Okay, just like that child asking, why are no black people in this story? Right. We have to have the tools to be able to respond. And sometimes in the moment you don't know how to respond. And I think as adults, we have to move past like I'm the adult, I know all the answers, and mm -hmm. really model for children, hey, or be vulnerable enough to say, you know what? I don't know how to answer that right now. Let's think through how can we find the answer to that. Let's work on that together. Mm. That teaches problem solving skills, right? I don't have all the answers, but let's work together to have the answers. Or let me get back to you on that and really do get back to them 